one. Well, hey, everybody, this is Dr. Breon Hall. I'm the senior pastor of Greater New Psalmist Baptist Church right here in the wonderful city of Toledo, Ohio, 3251 Glendale Avenue. I am so grateful to the God that we serve that he has allowed us to come together one more time. I need you to do me a favor. This is what I need you to do. I need you to call all your family, your friends, your loved ones, people who have been going through like never before. This is a night we're going to talk about. I've got to practice social distancing. I need you to call that friend, that loved one, that partner uh, that has been dealing and battling with a place of how am I going to get through? How am I going to survive? How am I going to be all that God desires for me to be when I've got individuals that are around me who keep me held hostage to the person that I'm not trying to become, but the person that I was? It is so indicative for all of us to understand that the fact that God has saved us and delivered us, that we're not the person that we used to be, but we are in fact who God says that we are. And I want you to invite, share, bring all your friends on. We're going to have an incredible Bible study experience tonight that I believe will change not only your life, but will change the paradigm of the life that you're trying to make for you and your family. Now, I want to give a precursor tonight of the kind of biblicist that I am, the Bible's teacher that I am. My pedagogy may be somewhat different from others because I believe that the Bible is just not words on a page, but the Bible is in fact life. And those of us that read it, we will live by it. We will grow by it. The Bible is just not a composite of words written together so that you and I can have church and shout and jump and dance. But the Bible is in fact life. And so uh, my form of teaching and believing uh, how the world should change is in fact uh, what I believe is for us uh, the word of life. I believe that God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that you and I might have life and have that more abundantly. And so my teaching and preaching is very practical. I believe in the word of God. I believe that it's life. I believe that it can change. I believe that it can save, it can deliver. And the person that you are today is not the person that you have to be for the rest of your life because he who the sun sets free is in fact free indeed. And so gather around, bring them around the coffee table, bring them around the living room or the dining room table Let's have an incredible theological conversation about I've got to practice social distancing. You may say, Dr. Bree, who do I need on this watch tonight? Who do I need watching this live broadcast? Every individual who has made up in their mind that this is going to be their year and they're not going to allow the people that are around them to distract them anymore. But in fact, they're going to be individuals who will say, that this is going to be my season. This is my coming out party. And throughout this dialogue tonight, I want you to write on the screen. I want you to say where you're watching from and what your needs are. I'm believing God that he's going to meet every need. I'm also going to announce this at the end of our broadcast that those of you that have prayer requests, I want you to write us at info at greaternpc.org. Sunday morning in the midst of our live worship experience, our prayer ambassador, Elder Sheila Roberts, will pray over every person's names, every prayer desire, every prayer request, every person that writes in and says, I want you to join me in prayer for this, that, or the third. I believe that God still hears and answers our prayer. And tonight, I am certainly excited about the fact that the paradigm is getting ready to change and you're getting ready to be absolutely better. Let's pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you tonight for giving us an opportunity to come into your house one more time and to come into houses all around the world. As I sit in this sanctuary tonight, God, I pray that you would sit in their living rooms. I pray that you would sit on each of them as the Holy Spirit did on that day of Pentecost. God, I pray that you would change our trajectory for life, that God, you would cause us to see you in a way that we have never seen you before. I pray tonight, God, for some individual who needs to trust you in a place where we cannot trace you. We don't know what you're up to, but we do believe that you can do what you said. God, we thank you that in the midst of our adversity, you have shown us that you are the God that can advance us. And so we thank you for the adversity that's come, but we thank you for the advancement that's coming after the adversity is over. 
No weapon formed against us is going to prosper. And God, we declare that everything that rises up against us is not going to prosper. So we bless you and we give your name glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you again and welcome to uh, the Greater New Psalmist Church right here in Toledo, Ohio. I'm grateful to be your online pastor. I'm grateful that you're a part of our online church. So many of you around the world have been joining us. As a matter of fact, uh, our media team gave me the numbers today. In four weeks, we have reached over 42,000 people. 42,000 of you have watched us from different uh, corners and spheres of the world, and we're so grateful that you have partnered with us. I'm talking from Germany, Bermuda, the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, from the Ivory Coast, from South Africa, from West Africa, from Jamaica, Trinidad. Uh, we're so grateful to God uh, that you have been watching us, and we welcome you to our online family, and thank you for helping us to make the difference. But I also got to give an incredible shout out to the people that I pastor here locally, the greatest people on the planet, the members of the Greater New Psalmist Baptist Church. If you're out there, just wave your hand on the screen and say, I'm a part of it. I'm so grateful for these incredible people who have been doing great things during the midst of this pandemic to help our church continue to do what it does. And I'm grateful for all of you who have partnered in uh, become our family away from our family you are indeed a blessing to the body of Christ well last few weeks we've been talking a lot about this pandemic and COVID-19 and the coronavirus and I said that in the midst thereof I was going to use what looks to be a bad situation and somehow or another use it for what could be our progression the God that we serve is able to progress us. And the problem with so many of us who are part of this postmodern Christian culture is that we have a problem understanding that before there can be progress, there must first be a process. I need you to write that on the screen. Before there can be a progress, there must first be a process. And the problem with so many of us is that we have trouble facing the process. We don't like what God does. We don't like how God does it. And God does unusual things to get our attention. He takes us through the worst to bring the best out of us. And as someone that's watching me tonight and you're trying to figure out why you've been going through this plethora of chaos and why it seems as if every time you get to the place where you're supposed to be, that the enemy tries to rise up against you. But I'm declaring over your life tonight that the weapons that form, they won't prosper and you're going to come out of this because you understand that there must be a process before there is progress. You, you got to get that. There must be a process before there is progress. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm a astute person. I'm an astute person. And I believe that persons who go through it will come out of it knowing that they did not get out of it just because of how lucky they were. But they got out of it because of how blessed they were. And the enemy has been trying to do all he can to keep you from the place where God has designed for you to be. But you've got to continue to declare over your life, your family, and everything that's connected to you that you will be victorious. That's good news for somebody that's watching tonight, someone who's going through uh, pressures and sicknesses and diseases, that this is not going to last. As a matter of fact, the God that we serve has the ability to turn things around whenever he wants to do it because he is God by himself. In the midst of this pandemic, we've heard a lot about social distancing and staying away from people because we never know if people are asymptomatic. Persons who are asymptomatic means that they are carriers of the coronavirus or COVID-19, but they have shown no symptoms. They look good on the outside, but there's something happening to them on the inside. And they may never get sick from the infectious disease that they carry, but you could in fact become sick from them and end up dying. Well, according to scripture, as it is in the natural, ladies and gentlemen, so it is in the spiritual. And you and I have got to guard ourselves against infectious people, people who have become contamination for us, people who have become dogmatic to us and people who have become damnable to our souls, our spirits, our aspirations, and our desires. We must begin as a people to allow ourselves 
to be a part of social distancing. I want you to write that on the screen, say it loud and proud. I'm going to be a part of social distancing. What that simply means is I'm going to allow myself to use social distancing as a part of my daily practice. Every believer who is watching me must understand the fact uh, that you and I are proof positive of the fact that we have survived against all the odds of life. And we've survived it because we've been careful to govern ourselves to the laws of scripture. Even as we have governed ourselves to the laws of the land, we have also governed ourselves according to the law of scripture. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I must now understand one important law, and that is the law of separation. Many of you could be further along in life, but you've got individuals who like you not for who you are, but they like you for what you have. They like you, they desire you because they know that you are someone who's positive, you, you keep a job, you keep a nice house, you drive a nice car, you've got good credit. And they keep you around because they feel like what you have, they could take advantage of, and you could help them get ahead. But the reality is they're bringing nothing to the table for you. They're only pulling away from you. And this must be a season where you and I decide within our hearts and our minds that I'm not going to allow anything to rob me of the joy that I believe that God wants me to have. I need you to get this tonight because I believe that every person that's watching me, God desires that you have joy. But Dr. Bree, I'm in a precarious situation. I don't know how I can create a place of social distancing, and I'm not even sure what the scripture says. Understand this, that the scripture actually encourages social distancing. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 17, uh, he says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. He says, come out from among them and be ye separate. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 17. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Watch this here. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. He says, if you don't touch it, I'm going to receive you. Isn't it amazing, ladies and gentlemen, that one of the things that we've learned about this whole social distancing is that we've got to be careful what we touch and what we allow to touch us. We've got to be careful where our hands go and make sure our hands don't go to our face. Make sure that we don't touch contaminated objects or contaminated people because you never know where this virus is. He says, watch this. He says, do not touch the unclean thing, and I'm going to receive you. What you touch could cause you to be hindered from him touching you. I want you to put that on the screen. What you touch could hinder him from touching you. The very thing that you touch could hinder you from having the relationship with God that God desires to have with you. The very people that you keep within the circumference of who you are could be the individuals that are keeping you from having a productive, holistic relationship with God. He says, if you touch the unclean thing, you run the risk of me not touching you. And somebody tonight needs to understand that you're tired of going through life, having other people touch you and feel on you and pull away from the power that's inside of you. But tonight you're making up in your mind that you're not going to allow any unclean thing to come nigh you. According to Psalms 91 and 11, he says, listen, I won't allow the unclean thing to come nigh you. He says, I will keep you. And every believer who's under the sound of my voice is an individual that understands that where you are is where God wants to keep you only temporarily. And you've got to be careful what you touch because what you touch could hinder him from touching you. In the midst of this whole pandemic, this entire case of COVID-19 and the coronavirus, domestic violence has been on a rise. And there are many of you that are watching tonight either know someone who's in the midst of a domestic violent relationship, they are in the midst of it, or you know someone, or it is even yourself that's in the midst of something 
that is volatile, something that has violated the very essence of who you are and has kept you from knowing your true potential. Every one of you in this that's watching me tonight are individuals that have incredible potential. And you've got to be careful not to allow people around you who try to rob you of your potential. You've got individuals who desire to steal, kill, and to destroy. According to the New York Times, this lockdown with an abuser has become an incubator for abuse and violence. You gotta understand this, that abuse starts verbal. It then becomes emotional. It then is spiritual, physical, and ultimately, it's fatal. And ladies and gentlemen, tonight, there's someone who's watching, who's trying to figure out how can I put distance between me and the people that keep violating me. The people that I've tried to help, the people that I've tried to get through, the people that I've tried to pull up. And every time I try to pull them up, it seems like they keep pulling me down. They are, in fact, abusers and users. And what you've got to understand tonight is that God has given you the challenge to move beyond the parameter of your abuser. God has given you the strength, the power, the tenacity to understand that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But you must first become tired of the environment. Many of us stay in things too long because it's comfortable. We like it because we don't want to start over. We like it because we feel like the person is going to change. We like it because we believe we can love them past it. We like it because we believe that we can help build them. We want to have a project. We want to help them. There's a good person on the inside of them. I just got to give them a chance to prove who they are. And unfortunately, there have been so many people who have lost their lives trying to help someone who did not want to help themselves. You and I have got to learn how to practice social distancing. What is amazing, ladies and gentlemen, is that uh, we ask ourselves this question. How do we get rid of toxic people who love seeing you where you are, suffering, struggling, broken, defeated, have nothing, goals are gone, they like seeing you drain. But tonight, you've got to make up in your mind that I'm tired of people who enjoy seeing me dream. I want people around me who understand what my true and honest potential is. So the Bible says, separate yourself. Come out from among them. Be ye separate. And do not touch the unclean thing. He says, if you do, I'm going to. To receive you. And tonight I want to encourage the heart of some believer who is watching us, who understands that God has not put anything on you, that he's not able to help you bear. And I know while it looks dismal, it looks difficult, it looks hard, I want you to understand within your spirit, God has already given you what you need, but you got to get rid of the toxicity that is around you, the toxic people whether they are loved ones, family members, children, lovers, significant others, spouses, friends, co-workers, you must make up in your mind that this is the season where I live for God and not for anybody else. The scripture says, as for me in my house, we will serve and praise the Lord. In the book of Genesis chapter number 31, verse 49, Jacob and Laban are having an incredible conversation. It's an incredible conversation because Jacob is tired of being used. I'll say it again. Jacob is tired of being used. He is used by Laban. For 20 years, he's worked in the house for Laban. 14 years for his daughters. Six years for cattle. And 10 years, his wages kept changing. 14 years for his daughters, six years for cattle, and 10 years, his wages kept changing. Many of you who are watching tonight, you are in an abusive situation. 
not with someone who is verbal, not with someone who is physical, not with someone who is spiritually damaging, but someone who's just emotionally toxic and they keep changing on you. They cannot make up their minds who they want to be, so they keep you in limbo about who you are. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, you got to put some social distancing there. You've got to make up in your mind, here it is, that if people do not regard the person that I desire to be, if they cannot regard the fact that I've been loyal, I've been true, I've been what I'm supposed to be, and the same cannot be offered from the other party, then ladies and gentlemen, you've got to be willing to break ties with that. In verse number 49, the Bible says, in Mispah, the Hebrew word, which means watchtower, they took stones and put some separation between them and this is what Laban said in the midst of the chaos. Laban says, the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. Ladies and gentlemen, Laban decided that he was going to release Jacob. You go do what you want to do. You're right. 20 years I've held you hostage. 20 years I've changed. 20 years you've worked. 14 years for my daughter. 6 years for the cattle. I kept changing up on you, change your wages, change my mind. I kept changing because I'm unstable. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is for somebody who's watching tonight. You got to understand that there may not be people who will walk from you. But in this season, whether it's a co-worker, a church member, a leader, a person who's a spiritual advisor, a spiritual connection, you got to be willing to desire more for you than you desire for them. This is not the season for you to continue to be the person that you were. But in fact, this is the season for you to be the person that God has desired for you to be. And I need everybody who's watching tonight, I need you to lift your hands and write on the screen that this is going to be my season. I need you to get that. That's just not a cliche. That is a fact. You will begin to declare over your life that I'm going to be everything that God desires for me to be. So Jacob releases him. He says, I'm going to allow some distance to be between us. And what is amazing, ladies and gentlemen, is that there are persons who will drive you to the edge. They will call you to come out of character. You've been acting different since you've been connected to them. You've not been yourself. You've not been able to find you in the midst of the agony, the pain, you're waking up crying. You're going to bed crying. You're at work crying. You're at the stoplight crying. You're in the grocery store crying because all the person does is bring you grief. You have not found, watch this, any happiness in yourself. And because you have not found any happiness in yourself, you keep looking for happiness in somebody else. But ladies and gentlemen, you will not be able to find happiness in other people until you first find happiness in yourself. This must be your mantra in 2020, going into 2021. I'd rather have six feet between us uh, in one direction rather than have six feet between us in another direction. I'd rather have six feet between us horizontally than to have six feet between us vertically. Meaning, ladies and gentlemen, I'd rather have six feet between us while we're on land than to have six feet between us because you caused me to do something to put you six feet under or you made yourself do something to put me six feet under. You got to understand something, ladies and gentlemen, that your life is worth living and there's more to life than this present scene that you see. As a matter of fact, where you are is just one particular episode. Where you are is just one particular chapter in your life. And you cannot die in the midst of this chapter because you don't like the way the story is going. You don't like the things that you're seeing. You don't like the way that it is. You don't like the way things have been going. And you desire to see some things change. You gotta make up in your mind. I'd rather have six feet between us horizontally than to have six feet between us vertically. And so Jacob says, I got to go. Laban says, I'm going to release you. There are many of you who are watching tonight that must take within your own heart the desire that you're going to please God. You're not going to be abused by people. 
either verbally, mentally, emotionally, but you're going to become everything that God desires for you to be. In Genesis chapter 16, verse number 6, there's a conversation between Lot and Abram. In Genesis uh, chapter 13, verse number 6, Abram and Lot could not dwell together in the same land. The Bible says the land could not bear them. And ladies and gentlemen, some of you just cannot occupy the same space with people. You are living in a tempestuous environment that you hate to go home, you hate to go to the house because someone is invading your space, your territory, and you just can't dwell together in the same place. There's some people that you've got to love from a distance. There's some people that you've got to put some distance between you. You can't talk to them every day because they're going to bring you down. You can't see them every day because you can't stand their negativity. You can't holler at them every month because you don't like the way they treat you because it's toxic. There are people who don't want anything out of life and you all can't occupy in the same space. Verse number six, he says, it says, and the land they couldn't occupy. But look at verse number seven. Verse number seven, they said, let there be no strife between us. Let's, let's not have another day of arguing. Let's not have another day of fighting. There's got to come a time in your life where you love you enough not to go through another day of anguish. You're not going to live like that. I just refuse to live in a place where I feel isolated by myself and I feel like that I feel like the person that I am becoming is a threat to the person that you are. Ladies and gentlemen, understand this, that the strife that's been going on must stop. The strife that's in your life is not satisfying to you. As a matter of fact, the strife that's in your life has been stifling your growth. It's been causing you not to become the individual that God wants you to become. And tonight I came on prophetic assignment to tell every person that's watching this broadcast that the thing that you try to become is what God wants you to become, but you will become it because you desire more out of life than what you have ever seen. They said, listen, let, not be no, let there be no strife uh, between us because strife in verse number seven had come between the herdsmen. But verse eight, uh, they have a conversation and Abram says to Lot, let there be no strife. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. In verse 7, there is strife between the herdsmen, the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot. There is strife. And how many of you have had your life almost destroyed because of an outside interference? I mean, the people that are connected to you are not getting along, so it causes you not to get along. And what is amazing, ladies and gentlemen, is that they say, listen, it's too big. The world is too big. The land is too big. The property is too big. You go one way. I'm going to go the other way. If you go to the right, I'm going to go to the left. And if you go to the left, I'm going to go to the right. It's called practicing social distancing. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, there are some individuals that are in your life that you've got to be willing to practice social distancing with. You've got to make up in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, that I'm not going to be that person anymore. I'm tired of going through the pain, the hassle, the frustration, and the brokenness. I'm tired of waking up feeling bad. I'm tired of allowing you to dictate the kind of day I'm going to have. I'm tired of crying over someone that's just not worth it. If you go to the left, I'm going to go to the right. And if you go to the right, I'm going to go to the left. We just cannot go in the same direction. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, how can two walk together except they agree? And how it is, ladies and gentlemen, that many of you are trying to walk in the same direction with people that you're having friction with. People who don't see your true, honest potential, who are fighting you. 
on every hand. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was a conversation that Lot had with Abram. It was a conversation that Jacob had with Laban. But I want to talk about Jesus Christ because you and I are, in fact, the followers of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure many of you are thinking Jesus never had to practice social distancing. I know, I know, you're, you're saying that Jesus never had to practice social distancing. I, I know, I know, you're, you're watching tonight and you're saying that Jesus, who is divinity, never had to practice social distancing. But understand that Jesus is not just divinity, but Jesus is humanity. Jesus is God wrapped in flesh. The Bible says he dwelt among them. And the problem with many of us in this sociological world is that we can do well if it's just us and God, but we have to dwell with them. The thems that are in your life who try to always cause chaos, havoc. Come on, you know somebody like that who always cause confusion, who always want to pull you back to the person you want to be. They, they don't... They don't want you to become better and they can't stand for you to be great. When you look at John chapter 11, verse 53, the Bible says, and from that day. Well, what is so significant about that day? Understand that this is when Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been in the grave for three days. His sisters are saying it's too late. It's over for my brother. It's done. It's over. You should have come a little sooner and you could have saved my brother. Jesus says, I'm not concerned about how long it's been. I just want you to show me where you laid him. The Bible says that Jesus goes to the foot of that grave where Lazarus is. And Jesus says to him, Lazarus, come forth. The Bible says that Lazarus comes forth bound and tied in grave clothes. Jesus never unties him. Jesus never looses him. But he says to those that bound him, loose him. You, you tied him. Now loose him. Now you bound him. Now you free him. And you let him go. What well, Jesus' popularity grew, according to the scripture, that the people who were around him got tired because all of a sudden his popularity is growing. And it is amazing, brothers and sisters, when you read this particular passage, that from that day forward, Jesus decided that he was not going to walk anymore among them. From that day, according to scripture, they sought, watch this, to kill him. Look at verse number 53. They decided that they were going to kill Jesus. Kill him because his power was increasing. And how many people do you have around you that have ever tried to kill your name, kill your reputation, kill your career, your dreams, your desires, your, your aspiration? They're just toxic people who set out to kill you because you're outgrowing them. They are people that are on your job. They are people who don't like you because they're intimidated by the very fact that you've got something that they want. You're growing, you are succeeding. And many of you are in a hostile situation because you've outgrown the people that have become comfortable with where you were. They can't stand you. They thought that by now you would have quit. They thought that by now you would have given up. They thought that by now you would have just thrown in the towel. You would have gave up on the fact that you were going to be a business owner, you would have gave up on the fact of going back to school to get your degree, to get your GED, to get your master's, to get your PhD. They thought by now that their killing you would have destroyed the fact that you would have been what God wants you to be. But tonight, every person that's watching me, you need to put on that screen, I'm still here. Go ahead and do it. Do it for every hater. Do it for every naysayer. Do it for every individual that has desired to steal and kill everything that you have. They are killers. They are dream killers. They are mind killers. They are aspiration killers. They are career killers. 
They sought to kill Jesus because Jesus had one day of success. The enemy is not mad about your 365 days of bad days. He's concerned about your one day that you didn't cry. Your one day that you didn't walk the floor. Your one day that you didn't feel like giving up and throwing in the towel. You made him nervous because you survived 24 hours too long. How in the world are you surviving after all the attacks that you have been through? How are you able to keep your mind together after walking the floor at night, worried about the things that people have tried to do to you? You'd be surprised at what the people who are in close proximity of you think of you. You'd be really surprised at the people that you've helped, the people that you've given jobs to, the people that you've loaned money to, the people that you've given rides to. You'd be surprised what they think about you. You'd be surprised how they feel about you. You'd be really surprised, ladies and gentlemen, the people that you've really got to put social distancing between you and them because they just don't understand the path that God has you on. So they hold you hostage because they like you being needy. They like you desiring. They like you wanting. They like you begging. They like you when you're complaining. They like you when you're always sad. They like you when you're always sick. But I'm prophesying tonight to somebody that your days of lack have come to an end. Your days of wanting has come to an end. Your days of sickness has come to an end because you're getting ready to bounce back from everything that the devil tried to kill you in. Verse number 54, Jesus decides he's not going to walk openly among them anymore. You and I must decide that there are going to be some people that we are connected to that we just won't walk around anymore. There's some people that we just refuse to be around. Some people I just can't go around because I just know what they're going to say. They're going to say something that's going to anger me. They're going to say something that's going to frustrate me. They're going to say something to keep me from my destiny. Verse 54, it says, And Jesus walked no more among them openly. Get this here, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus was not afraid of what they would do to him. Jesus was afraid of what he might do to them. See, the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is not what they can do to you. The problem is what you could possibly do to them. So many people have played you as weak and insignificant and having no strength and having no power and having no authority. They walked over you. You've been the last hired, the first fired. You've been overlooked most of your life. You felt defeated, walked in a place of depression. But when you look at verse number 54, the Bible says, and Jesus goes to a place called Ephraim. Oh, I need you to get that. He goes to Ephraim. Ephraim in the Greek means double. And I'm prophesying to somebody tonight that you've got to find your Ephraim. You've got to find your place of double. Because everything that you have been through has qualified you for the miracle. Everything that you have gone through has qualified you for the breakthrough, for the comeback. God has positioned you for the greatest moment of your life. And I'm declaring over your life that God is getting ready to give you double. Somebody needs to scream that. Somebody needs to shout that in your living room. Somebody needs to holler at the screen. Somebody needs to write it on the screen. I'm getting ready to go in a place of double. They tried to kill me. They tried to destroy me. They tried to take me out. But because I remain faithful to God, God is getting ready to give me double. I need y'all to shout that in Georgia, shout it in Virginia, 
shout it in North Carolina, shout it in Mississippi, shout it in Indiana, shout it in Ohio, shout it all around the world. God is about to give me double. You're in Texas, shout it. You're in Louisiana, shout it. God is about to give me double. And when you begin to declare it, it does not matter what they did to you. God says, I'm going to give you a place called double. And ladies and gentlemen, tonight I'm prophesying that your double is coming within the next few moments. Oh yeah, they wanted to see you dead because they couldn't handle your popularity. They couldn't handle what God was doing in your life. They couldn't handle the fact that you were coming out of the place that was broken. You're coming out of abuse. You're coming out of a hostile situation. You are rising up tonight. Everybody needs to scream tonight, I'm rising up out of this. Come on, Atlanta. Rise up. Come on, Baltimore. Rise up. Come on, Parksley, Virginia. Rise up. Come on, East and shore rise up come on come on mississippi come on toledo rise up come on texas rise up you are in fact who god says you are and you're not going to allow their warning to kill you to stop you from your mission and jesus goes to a desert place called ephraim verse number 55 ladies and gentlemen the bible says it was the passover when you look at verse 55, uh, the Passover drew nigh, and everybody was showing up for the Passover. This is the time that everybody gets together. It's, it's the day. It's, it's the day where, where, where everybody gets together. It's like Toledo Day. It's like Aconite Day. It, it's the day where everybody gets together, and in verse number 55, everybody's gathering. And guess who they're looking for? They're at the temple. It's the Passover. Look at verse 56. And they begin to ask themselves, has, has anybody seen him? Have you, have you seen Jesus? Verse 56, they're at the temple. They're at church. And they're asking, have, have you seen him? Do you know where he is? Do you, do you think he'll show up? Do you think he'll come? What was so bad to make Jesus not want to go to church? Oh, I know that's good. I, I know you're shouting in your kitchen. What was so bad that Jesus said, I just don't want to be around them. Because I know that somehow or another, they're going to say something to me and it's going to take me off my track and it's going to cause me to miss my destiny. But I also know they're trying to kill me. And how do you live your life with people try to kill you. People who try to take you out. You, you got to put some social distancing between you and those people. How do you handle life when you're in the midst of the greatest season of your life? You've had an incredible day and all of a sudden you find yourself in the midst of your verse 53 where they're seeking to kill you. You're at 54 and you decide you can't walk openly with these people anymore. How do I cut off people who used to turn me on? How do I get rid of people who I thought were my ride or die. Your color is not always your kind. We are so quick to make everything racial divide when the problem is most of the time the people who look just like you. It's 
it's not a racial issue. It's a cultural issue. They don't like the person that you are becoming because they thought they had you figured out. They just knew that you would not be this successful. And tonight, I need you to hear me that if they didn't like you the way you were yesterday, they will not be able to stand you tomorrow. Somebody needs to put that on that screen that I am who God says I am. I'm the first, not the last. I'm the head, not the tail. But for right now, I got to put some social distance in between us. I've got to practice some social distancing. Man, I thought I thought my prayer partner was, was my boy. I thought my, 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 my prayer partner wasn't my girl. I thought, I thought, I thought the people in my family had my back. I thought they would never forsake me like this. I thought, I thought I would have never thought my own brother. I would have never thought my own son. I would have never thought that. And God says, be not dismayed. Whatever be tied. That's according to the hymn. God is going to take care of you. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I came on assignment to tell every believer that when you begin to practice social distancing, you will understand the real connect between you and the discovery of deliverance. Some people really don't want deliverance. Some people just want detachments. Detachment only means that at any given moment, the thing that you were attached to, that you became detached from, will end up becoming reattached to you. So in this season, don't pray for detachment. Pray for deliverance. That hostile environment does not have to be yours forever. It's temporary. And God is not going to put anything on you that he's not able to help you bear. But you got to want it for yourself. You got to want that healing. You got to want that deliverance. You got to want to be set free. You got to want to be out of that situation. You got a desire to be all that God wants you to be. And you refuse to allow others to use and dictate you. This is a season where you will become the composite of all of your experience. The fact that God is making you an expert is that he's let you live through things that ordinary people would have never survived. And you gotta understand something tonight, that the greater is he lives inside of you. You got angels, and tonight you gotta practice writing your angels, letting your angels go out on your behalf and take care of everything that you can't handle for yourself. Come here, I need you to hear me tonight. That you're watching in a space where you need God to come through for you like never before. And all I need you to do is understand the fact that God has you positioned for greatness. The greatness that God wants to present is a greatness that you didn't even deserve. He did it because he loved you. The Father loves you tonight with all of your hangups, with all of your failures and your destructive ways. He loves you. You haven't always been the person that you needed to be and there are people who will hold you hostage to it and they'll keep it hung over your head about what you did 20 years ago and they'll try to bring it up because you're at the place of being successful and they'll think, you know, you're better because you were the one in the family that 
got the degree, you started the business, and you moved ahead, and you had some bumps and bruises in the road, but but you got yourself together. You came out of it, and you 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 know you you got to the place where God designed for you to be, and and you grew out of your experience. You didn't die in the midst of it, and you're not big and borrowing and stealing, and you didn't use anybody to get to where you are, and you allowed God to organically allow you to maturate to become that person that you are, and you did not get it by any ways other than you trusted God. You trusted him when you didn't know what he was up to. You trusted him when you had to go home and lay in fetal positions because you didn't know what God was going to do. Many days, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't know who I was, what I wanted to be, where I was going, and was I good at anything? And I'd leave church and go home and lay in fetal positions, take NyQuil to try to numb the pain so I could sleep because I didn't like the person that I was because there were people who were around me trying to kill me just because I had one successful day and God was preparing me for a successful life. And the enemy will always try to rise up at the most perfect time. But tonight I'm declaring to every person that's watching me, you are in the best place that you could ever be. And the fact that you have survived against the odds is proof positive that God wants to do something for you that you can't do for yourself. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear me tonight. That the Father sent me on assignment to talk to you about social distancing. Put that distance between you and your failure. You, you, you may have to put some social distancing between you and your mistakes and the people that remind you or keep bringing up what you did wrong. You may have to distance yourself from people who keep you in a position of feeling bad about who God has made you. Your very success bothers some people. But I'm declaring tonight that you're going to be okay. You're, you're going to love you enough to like the person that God is making you. And you're not going to live as if you have no hope. You're going to live like you believe that the God we serve is going to bring you through this. I got to tell you this before we go to this little break. That God wants the best out of you. He wants you to become better than what you are. You've got to now desire it for yourself. Listen, no good thing will he withhold from those that love him. And all you need to do is begin to say to yourself, yes, Jesus, say it with me, loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Hey, listen, you're in the greatest moment of your life. All you got to do now is practice some social distancing. Just practice it. Hey, declare over your life can't do it. We argue, we fuss, we have more bad days than we do good. It's too up and down. I got some things I'm trying to get to. I got some dreams, I got some realities, I got some aspirations. And the last thing I need is someone standing in my way. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it's greatness inside of you. It's greatness inside of you. I say this all the time that the deoxyribonucleic acid of who you are, the DNA that God has placed inside of you is far greater than any demon that would ever try to usurp authority over you. I gotta practice social distancing. I gotta become better. I'm tired of being around people who are diseased and contaminated and contagious because association brings about a simulation. I'm starting to act like the people that I don't like. I'm starting to be just like them. And I'm not liking what I see. So I got to change my surroundings. 
I'm becoming evil. I'm grumpy all the time. I won't pray. I won't seek the face of God. I'm cussing more. I'm drinking. I'm going back to getting high. And that's not the person I desire to be. I want to be everything that God wants me to be. I want to be productive. And I will. Oh yeah, I will. I'm, I'm changing today. I'm making up in my mind today that I am changing. And somebody's watching me tonight. Your change is inevitable. That's why the fight has been so tempestuous. The closer you get to destiny, the more the attack intensifies. Somebody on the screen, I must be close. Now listen, I'm very thankful for all of you who partner with our ministry. I'm thankful to God for this word and uh, there's gonna be a brief two and a half minute commercial. We want you to watch it. We want you to share with us in anything that God has given you. Make sure you write us and I'll come back in a few moments and I'm gonna pray with you before we go off. But stay tuned for this two and a half minute commercial and I need all our partners to get ready. Well, hey there, this is Dr. Bray and I'm sure that you have enjoyed the worship experience that has already gone forth. And I'm sure that many of you who have partnered with our ministry around the length and breadth of our country, or even around the world, you are enjoying what you have witnessed God do at this incredible place. I'm so thankful that God allowed you to be in worship with us today via Facebook or YouTube or even Instagram. And many of you who have partnered with us around the world, I'm so thankful to God for you. So many of you are members of our ministry and you were not able to make it to worship today. And this is an opportunity for you to get ready to give to the God of our salvation. Giving is still a part of worship. As a matter of fact, the scripture talks more about giving than it does anything else. Even at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 8, it says, As long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. And this is your opportunity to give your seed and watch God give you a harvest. Remember this, according to Malachi, the scripture says, bring all the tithes and offerings to the storehouse that there may be meat in yours. And I know many of you are going through this pandemic and some of you have been going through hell and hurt and pain and disappointments. But the God we serve allows you to bring yourself out of it because of the seed that you sow. There are many ways that you can give, you will see on our screen. I want you to partner with us. If you are a member of our church, this is your time to give or return the Lord's tithe. This is your opportunity for you to give or sow your seed of faith, or even sow into the life of the pastor. I'm grateful that God loved us enough to come into your homes today. And I want you to know that you're coming out of where you are. And I want you to partner with us as we pray for you financially that God would get the glory out of your life and that no good thing will he withhold from those of you who love him and keep his commandments. Sowing is a part of his commandment. When you read throughout the scripture, it talks about giving to God and you shall be pressed, you shall be blessed. You will get it pressed down, shaken together, running over. And I'm confident that in this season of your life, God has more to give you than you could ever give to him. You cannot beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. So try it. Try him today with that seed of faith, that offering of faith, with that tithe, and watch what God does in your life. I'm so thankful to be your online pastor, and I'm so grateful that we're your online church. Now partner with us as we continue to occupy all streets in our city and to cultivate cultural change in our community. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for your gifts. We see them coming in already. Thank you for partnering with the greatest church on the planet. I'm so thankful that you joined us this week and I'm so grateful to the Father for giving us another chance, man. Listen, I want you uh, to join me 
uh, tonight at 9 o'clock, tonight at 9 p.m. from Brayon Hall after dark. That means we revisit what we just talked about tonight, just a small dialogue. It's only about 30 minutes. It's not a long time. Uh, I want to continue to keep you engaged and keep you talking and keep us together as a family. And I'm believing that God is going to do some great things for us. So meet us at 9 p.m. from Breon Hall after dark as we have a discussion about what we talked about tonight. And I can give you even some more information. On Wednesday at midnight, that's the night that everybody gets excited about. It's called the Midnight Cry. And I want you to know that God is up to something. God is positioning us for some great things. God is doing some phenomenal things for us. And I'm thankful for what God is getting ready to do in the lives of his people. So I pray tonight for every person, for every child of God, that God will do exactly what he says, that God will bring us through stuff that ordinary people would have never survived. You are, in fact, where God wants you to be. And I want you to know, that you are the righteousness of God. Wednesday night, midnight cry. Don't miss it. I'm so thankful that you joined us tonight for this conversation, this Bible study, this uh, indifferent dialogue about I've got to practice social distancing. But tonight, I want you to understand that whatever you put distance between, God has the power to deliver you from. And my prayer is that you would become delivered, not detached, and you'll become all that God has called you to be. I love you so much with the love of God. Remember that God honors faith and faith honors God. We are Greater New Psalmist Baptist Church. We are occupying all streets here in our city of Toledo, Ohio, while we're cultivating change in this contemporary culture. Lord, we thank you so much for every person that loves you enough, God. And I pray that if there's a person that's watching tonight that's not saved, that God, you would save them according to your word in Romans 10 and 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, that thou shalt be saved. Tonight, God, we confess that Jesus Christ is our Savior, that he died on the cross and you raised him from the dead. Lord, I thank you for the challenges that we've been through, but Lord, I praise you for where you're taking us to. I thank you, Father, that you have brought us out of so much, and I pray that you would continue to bless us like never before. God, I pray tonight that you would get the glory out of what we say and do. And I thank you that this word would find a lodging place and persons would get better out of this. We're not going to be bitter, but we're going to be better because we are practicing social distancing. So bless your people tonight. Bless them all across this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, family. In one and a half hour, I'll see you back from Brian Hall after dark. Remember that this is your season to practice social distancing. Get away from the toxic. Get away from the bad relationships. Get away from stuff that cannot promote your growth, but only holds you to who you are. I'm Dr. Bree, and I'll see you next time.